Hey there everyone, Jeff Murren here. I'm wanting to continue the discussion of the Odyssey, specifically the Robert Fagel's translation. Um, today I'm going to be discussing book two, Telemachus Sets Sail. Now you may uh, notice here that the environment is a little bit different than it usually is. Uh, most of the time whenever I deliver these little chats, I like to be in my own backyard under the canopy of banana trees. Um, but it is mid-July, and this is South Texas, so um, I think uh, air conditioning is here to stay, and I think I'm here to stay in the air conditioning myself. So I will be uh, delivering these from indoors for a while. Anyway, let's take a look at uh, book two, and book two is important because in book two, we get to see further characterization of Telemachus, Odysseus's son. And as we notice from book one, to learn about Telemachus is in a sense a way to learn about Odysseus as well, because he, the two of them have been linked together. Like you are so much like your father. I see your father in you and things like that. All right. So the more we get to know Telemachus, the more we also get to know um, Odysseus in a strange way, uh, not a strange way, but He's a chip off the old block kind of a thing, all right? Um, also, we get to see, I brought up Alc uh, Alcinus, okay? He is the most outspoken, biggest jerk of the suitors, the men who have come to try to win over Penelope, Odysseus's wife, in his absence. Because if they are to win her over, then they get all of Ithaca. They get to rule over Ithaca. They get all the spoils of uh, Ithaca and everything that Ithaca has to offer. Of course, they're wearing out their welcome. We talked about Xenia. We talked about how that is a going against what the gods actually want. Um, and so they're putting themselves in a really bad place. And Telemachus, if Penelope does not marry, Telemachus is the one to then take that throne and that that royalty, if you will, or the, the rulership of Ithaca. So really, there is a lot of tension between Telemachus and these suitors who are here to uh, win everything they can. <laughs> they're, they're the guys who try to get the most out of doing the least, and that's what they're here to do. All right. So let's go ahead and let's take a uh, a look at the very beginning here, Telemachus sets sail. When young Dawn, with her rose-red fingers, shone once more, the true son of Odysseus sprang from bed and dressed. Over his shoulder he slung his well-honed sword, fastened rawhide sandals under his smooth feet, and stepped from his bedroom, handsome as a god. All right, a couple things. Notice Dawn has a capital D. Dawn with her rose-red fingers. All right. Dawn is considered not just to be the dawn or the sun coming up over the horizon. Dawn is an actual god, goddess. All right. Um, and so they did not necessarily see the rising of the sun as just, you know, the scientific way that we are going around the sun or the, you know, the the way we, we spin and go around. It wasn't anything like that. It was, this is a, a God is creating this and God is doing this, all right? And we see that uh, Telemachus is handsome as a God because he's got some big work that he's gonna have to do. He's gonna have to convince some people that he is right for what is going to happen and that he is the one to take charge and that he is the one who is, after all, Odysseus's son. Let's continue. At once he ordered heralds to cry out loud and clear and summon the following, uh, summon the flowing haired Achaeans to full assembly. Their cries rang out. The people filed in quickly. When they grouped, crowding the meeting grounds, Telemachus strode in too, a bronze spear in his grip. And not alone, two sleek hounds went trotting at his heels. And Athena lavished a marvelous splendor on the prince, so the people all gazed in wonder as he came forward. Okay, so as we can see, even in this, even in drawing in a meeting to talk about something, 
Athena is there. And Athena is there to make it all better for him, to make him appear as though he is the one that they all need to pay attention to. So even as it's just something as mundane as a meeting, well, I don't want to say mundane as a meeting because we see that these are rare, especially in Odysseus's absence, but it is a, an assembly of all of the people there, all the men there, all of the suitors included, and Telemachus is going to address them. And Athena makes it so that he is a vision to them to where they are in awe. She's doing everything she can to try to help Telemachus in everything he's trying to accomplish. So on page 94, we see about line 38 that the herald Pisenor, skilled in customs ways, put the staff in Telemachus's hand, and then the prince addresses everyone. All right, now let me point out here, this is something that is a, 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 a standard, like this is whoever has the staff has the floor. All right, so it's kind of like if you've read Lord of the Flies, the conch shell. Whoever has the conch shell can address everyone. Same type of thing. So before this, we saw a lot of grumbling amongst the suitors who were there, saying like, why did anybody call a meeting? Who is the, who is, who is the person responsible for this meeting? What is the meaning of this meeting? We haven't had anything like this since Odysseus was around, all right? So then Telemachus gets the staff and everybody's like, oh, okay. The boy has something to say. And he does. He says, I was the one who called us together. Something wounds me deeply. Not news I've heard of an army on the march. Words uh, I've caught firsthand so that I can warn you now or some other public matter. I'll disclose and argue. No, the crisis is my own. Trouble has struck my house. A double blow. First... I've lost my noble father, who ruled among you years ago, each of you here, and kindly as a father to his children. Okay, so I've lost my father, who was your ruler, who ruled you in the kindest way possible. You owe him better than the way you're behaving now. It says, but now this, a worse disaster that soon will grind my house down, ruin it all, and all my worldly goods in the bargain. Suitors plague my mother against her will. Sons of the very men who are your finest here. They'd sooner die than approach her father's house, so Icarius himself might see to his daughter's bridal and hand her, hand her to whom he likes, whoever meets his fancy. Not they. They infest our palace day and night. They butcher our cattle, our sheep, our fat goats, feasting themselves, swilling down our wine as if there's no tomorrow, all of it squandered. Skipping down a few to the last two lines of that section, he says, by God, it's intolerable what they do. Disgrace my house, a shambles. You should be ashamed yourselves, mortified in the face of neighbors living, around, living round about. Fear the God's wrath before they wheel out and wheel in outrage and make these crimes recoil on your heads. I beg you by Olympian Zeus, by Themis too, who set assemblies free and calls us into session. Stop, my friends. Okay, so Telemachus is begging them outright, kind of giving them the opportunity to make things right. All just sat there, silent. No one had the heart to reply with harshness, only Antinous, remember him, who found it in himself to say, so high and mighty Telemachus, such unbridled rage. Well now, fling your accusations at us. Think to pin the blame on us, you think again. It's not the suitors here who deserve the blame, it's your own dear mother blaming the victim here, okay? The matchless queen of cunning. Look here. I think it's interesting. She is considered by Antinous and these suitors as the matchless queen of cunning. What did I say in the first video that Odysseus was known for? He was known for being clever. So here we're kind of starting to see, and it'll continue on as we move throughout the book, that these two, Penelope and Odysseus, may have been rightly joined as husband and wife. 
both of them being clever, both of them, and as it says here, cunning, all right, figuring out ways to adapt and make circumstances work as they see fit. All right, so I'm going to continue on. For three years now, getting on to four, she's played it fast and loose with all our hearts. Hmm. Building each man's hopes, dangling promises, dropping hints to each, but all the while with something else in mind. She set up a great loom in the royal halls, and she began to weave. And the weaving, fi and the weaving fine spun, the, yar the, in the yarn's endless, ah, and she would lead us on. Young men, my suitors, now that King Odysseus is no more, go slowly, keen as you are to marry me until I can finish off this web. So my weaving won't all fray and come to nothing. This is a shroud for old Lord Laertes, for that day when the deadly fate that lays us out at last will take him down. I dread the shame my countrywoman would heap upon me. Yes, if a man of such wealth should lie in state without a shroud for cover. So essentially what she says is, guys, if you will give me time, I'm weaving a shroud, something to cover the dead body of Laertes, my father-in-law, Odysseus's dad. He's old and I can't, I would not be a woman of the time if I were to let a powerful man like my father-in-law lie in state without a shroud to cover him up after he passes away. So please take your time and allow me to finish this. But get this. So by day, she'd weave at her great and growing web. By night, by the light of torches set beside her, she would unravel all that she had done. So she's like, guys, give me time. So she'd work all day weaving and weaving and weaving. And then at night, she would undo everything. So she's not actually making any progress. And here's something I think is important. It has taken them almost four years, the suitors, it's taken them almost four years to figure this out. One, they may not be that bright. Two, what do they really care? They're eating all they want to eat. They're drinking all they want to drink. And they're ordering all the shows of music and uh, singers that they ever care for. So they're doing all right in the meantime. All right, so the top of page 97, it says, send your mother back. Direct her to marry whomever her father picks, whoever pleases her, so long as she persists in tormenting us, quick to exploit the gifts Athena gave her, a skilled hand for elegant work, fine mind, and subtle wiles, too. It goes down further, about four lines, it says, not one could equal Penelope for intrigue. There again, we see how she is rightly chosen to be the wife of clever Odysseus. So we will devour your worldly goods and wealth as long as she holds out, holds to that course the gods have uh, charted deep inside her heart. Skipping a couple lines, we'll not go back to our old estates or leave for other parts, not till she weds the Argive man she fancies. So they say, hey man, no dice. We're going to keep on going on because it's her fault to begin with. She's gotten herself and then you as well in this mess. Okay. Telemachus responds, and I'd like to focus on the last three lines of that uh, page. It says, but if you decide the fair is better, richer here, destroying one man's goods and going scot-free, all right then, carve away. All right. Like, you go ahead. And just continue this path that you're on. Telemachus goes then and prays to Zeus on page 98. It says, and to seal his prayer, far-seeing Zeus went down, uh, sent down a sign. Okay. Now, if you remember from the Iliad, we had all of these bird signs. And someone mentioned the bird signs even in book one. Like, I'm not really skilled in figuring these out. Well, here we go. We're getting our first bird sign. And to seal his prayer, far-seeing Zeus sent down a sign. He launched two eagles, soaring high from a mountain ridge, and down they glided, borne on the wind's drafts a moment, wing to wing tip, uh, pinions straining taut, till just above the assembly's throbbing hum, they whirled, suddenly, wings thrashing, 
wild onslaught of wings, and banking down at the crowd's heads, a glaring fatal sign, talons slashing each other, tearing cheeks and throats. They swooped away and on, on the right through the homes and city. So remember, something on the right is different than something on the left, bird signs, all of this going back to the imagery and the signs that we saw in the Iliad. All right. So, um, Ali Thirsties offers up his interpretation of this sign about line 183. A great disaster is rolling like a breaker towards their, the suitors, heads. Clear Odysseus won't be far from loved ones any longer. Now, right now, he's somewhere near. I tell you, breeding bloody death for all these suitors here. Pains aplenty, too, for the rest of us who live in Ithaca's sunlit air. Okay, so that is the first interpretation of this. He goes on, and we see it towards the bottom, the last two lines there. It says, I said then, after many blows, and all his shipmates lost, after 20 years had wheeled by, he would come home, unrecognized by all. Remember that. And look, and now, look, it all comes to pass. Then, of course, we have a suitor comes back, says, Stop, old man, Eurymachus says, skipping down to about line 202, says, I'm a better hand than you at reading portents. Like, I like my interpretation better. Flocks of birds go fluttering under the sun's rays. Not all are fraught with meaning. Odysseus? He's dead now, far from home. Would to God that you died with him too. We'd have accepted your droning philosophies then and the way you've loosed the dogs of this boy's anger. Your eyes peeled for a house gift he might give you. Like, you're just saying this because you know he might take pity on you and you be, you know, treated with kindness, all right? You're trying to you know, win his favor, win Telemachus's favor, the man of the house, the current man of the house, all right? So he goes on to say, Telemachus, though in the same way he said Odysseus, Telemachus, let him urge his mother back to her father's house. Her kin will arrange the wedding, provide the gifts, the array that goes with a daughter dearly loved. Not till then, I'd say, will the island prince, princes quit their taxing courtship. Who's there to fear, I ask you? Surely not Telemachus, with all his tiresome threats. So they're not quite seeing in Telemachus what even Athena sees in Telemachus. Like he's just full of threats. He's just a boy. Don't worry about him at all. All right. Um, Telemachus speaks on, uh, it says, um, Page, uh, page 100, line about 243, says, Now, if I hear my father's alive and heading home, hard-pressed as I am, I'll brave out one more year. If I hear he's dead, no longer among the living, then back I'll come to the native land I love, raise his grave mound, build his honors high, with the full funeral rites that he deserves, and give my mother to another husband. Okay, that's exactly what Athena told him as mentees in the previous book. All right? So we have uh, the noble character of Mentor on page 250. And Mentor, I mean on line 250. And Mentor says, let's say about line 256, says, hear me, men of Ithaca, hear what I have to say. Line 260, think. Not one of the people whom he ruled remembers Odysseus now, that godlike man, as kindly as a father to his children. I don't grudge these arrogant suitors for a moment, weaving their violent work with all their wicked hearts. They lay their lives on the line when they consume Odysseus's worldly goods, blind in their violence, telling themselves that he'll come home no more. But all the rest of you, now you rouse my fury, sitting here in silence, never a word put forth to curb these suitors, paltry few as they are, and you so many. All right, so Mentor is saying, look, a lot of these people who are here, they don't remember Odysseus. He's been gone for 10 years. They were, uh, you know, not necessarily of age, all of them. And it's upsetting what they're doing. 
But it's also upsetting that other people here who do know Odysseus and who do remember Odysseus whenever he was a ruler, it makes me mad that you all aren't doing anything. And you know that's always the way, right? It's bad enough when somebody does something that's, that's mean-spirited, that's rude, that is, you know, violent even. And when someone doesn't intervene, they just sit idly by and allow it to happen. Shame on them too. If somebody says something rude to another person and you just sit there silently and watch it happen, it's on you too. That's what he's getting at here. All right? You can see here that they don't believe the Telemachus will make that trip, line 289, he'll never make that trip. Because remember, he's going to try to go off to talk to Nestor and talk to Menelaus to kind of try to find out where his father is, all right? We see that he prayed to Athena, all right? This is about line 295. It says, Dear God, hear me. Yesterday you came to my house. You told me to ship out on the misty sea and learn if father gone so long is ever coming home. Look how my countrymen, the suitors, most of all, the pernicious bullies foil each move I make. Says Athena came to his prayer from close at hand for all the world with mentors build and voice. So now she was like mentees before she's like mentor. Now I want you to take a look at line three, let's say 309 it says few sons are the equals of their fathers. Most fall short, all too few surpass them. But you, brave and adept from this day on, Odysseus's cunning has hardly given out in you. There's every hope that you will reach your goal. This is coming from Athena herself. Skipping a couple lines says, Not a shred of sense or decency in the crowd, nor can they glimpse the death and black doom hovering just at their heads to crush them all in one short day. So, in the way that we saw from the very beginning that Achilles was doomed in the Iliad, we see that these suitors are doomed from the very beginning of the Odyssey. All right, let's bring it on down to about line 325. It says, while I make the rounds in town, this is Athena speaking here, while I make the rounds in town and quickly enlist your crew of volunteers, Lots of ships in uh, Sea Grant Ithaca, old and new. I'll look them over. Choose the best in sight. We'll fit her out and launch her into the sea at once. All right. So you can also see Antinous making a fool of himself again. The last four lines is Antinous, Antinous, smiling warmly, sauntered up to the prince, grasped his hand and coaxed him, savoring his name, Telemachus. My high and mighty, fierce young friend, no more nursing those violent words and actions now. Come, eat and drink with us, just like the old days. Whatever you want, our people will provide. A ship and a picked crew to speed you on to Holy Pilus, out for, uh, out for news about your noble father. Skipping about three lines down, you ruffians carousing here. This is Telemachus's response. Isn't it quite enough that you, my mother's suitors, have ravaged it all, my very best, these many years, while I was still a boy? But now that I am full grown and can hear the truth from others, absorb it too. Now, yes, that the anger seethes inside of me. I'll stop at nothing to hurl destruction at your heads. About line 422, one of, uh, line one of, or page 105, then bright-eyed Pallas, that's Athena, thought of one more step. Disguised as the prince, disguised as Telemachus himself, the goddess roamed through the town, pausing beside each likely crewman, giving orders. Gather beside our ship at nightfall. Be there. She asked Naomon, uh, Phronius, generous son, to lend her a swift ship, and he gladly volunteer. Finally, on page 106, line 461, bright-eyed Athena sent them a stiff following wind, rippling out of the west, ruffling over 
the wine dark sea. So you can see, Telemachus has what it takes, but Telemachus is at odds with those suitors. There are more of them than there are of him, right? So they're not about to listen to him, and they stand to lose everything if he's the one who actually ascends to take over where Odysseus was. So they're not about to budge no matter what he has to say. But what you can see is, while Telemachus has what it takes, Athena also sees that Telemachus has what it takes. And if he does have what it takes, and he's got the goddess Athena to back him up, I don't know how I can lose. All right, so those are my thoughts. Book two, read book three, annotate book three, have your own thoughts of book three, meet me back here, and I will discuss book three and my own thoughts on it. So until then, and as always, Happy reading.